I'm Ali Patterson and welcome to The Fintech Show. On today's episode, we're looking at how cloud-based technology can connect the dots for huge multinational banks. With legacy systems still in place, the ability to innovate is stifled and all the while, agile tech is taking up market share. So, what's the answer? I wanted to find out how some companies and banks are using cloud platforms to keep their back and their mid offices connected. If data is the new oil, then the bank with the most streamlined systems will thrive. Joining me in the studio are three speakers from three organizations that are right at the cutting edge of cloud-based technology. From Boomi, a Dell Technologies business, we have Mike Kiersey. Boomi is a company that can get organizations of any size connected to a cloud native platform in a quick and easy fashion. From Tandem Bank, we have Noam Zigerson. Their chief data and technology officer was right at the heart of their transformation strategy. Last but not least, we have Jason Maud, Starling Bank's chief technology advocate, a role that is becoming increasingly important as financial services gets a wee bit more complex. So I joined Starling Bank uh, just over four years ago as a senior engineer, and I've now uh, progressed to the point where I am uh, what we term the chief technology advocate. and. The, the purpose of technology advocacy is to go and talk about the, uh, the technology behind, um, you know, a particular firm, organization, system, what have you, uh, in order to demystify it. Technology can sometimes be a little bit, um, look like a bit like black magic to some people. You know, people will go, well, how on earth does this work? Well, we've no idea. Our engineers understand it, but they just need techno babble at us yeah. and so on. And that doesn't really breed trust and you really need trust to be a bank and in order to trust starling bank you really need to test trust the technology and the technology uh culture behind it because we are an entirely digital bank there is no physical presence there is no high street branch that you can walk into so you really need to trust the technology and so it's my job to go around and uh, increase trust in the technology by demystifying it explaining it explaining what we do as a customer all I really see is the front end. I, I just see the fancy app, you know, the, the sleek front end, and there's some incredible front end services out there at the moment. So with that in mind, why should banks give a damn about investing in and, well, improving their, their core systems? You know, it's a great question. I think, you know, as you say, everyone's all about the experience and that front end whizzy experience, but actually, that is just the process layer in terms of what you see. Actually, a lot of the technology sits back in the core side of a bank, right? And those those existing monolithic or even legacy applications that host, you know, on process, you know, probably 70 to 80 percent of the banking sort of transactions all sit there. Right. And what you see is that data being proliferated up through a nice digital sexy channel that you see from your smartphone. And it's important that you know, what you see there is replicated through the whole supply chain, right? From front end to back end or in the middle of the office, etc. Because you can't make one end, one change at one end if you haven't made the changes at the other end, right? You've got to be able to expose more and more data in a qualified, in a quantified way that allow people to, to visualize that through their business applications, right? And do that at the same speed. And what you see is multiple speeds working with inside of a bank. I think some of the other things is also to be very cognizant of is that those platforms have been there for a very long time. And actually, in some cases, they're very robust, right? And, you know, they, they generate a huge amount of, of, of wealth for the and revenue for a banking organization. But what you tend to find is it's not those core banking platforms that are the problem. It's actually some of the associated services that sit around them that have been put into them over time. And as, as what I tend to talk about is, a lot, some of the bigger established banking organizations have grown up with the Roman road approach of legacy and technology debt, right? They're built on top, on top and on top of different technologies for point solutions that help solve them through multi-generations of technology change. And what needs to happen is some of that, that needs to be dug out, right? It needs to be reduce that complexity and that technology debt in some cases to allow a better transformation and ease and accessibility to some of those platforms today. Uh, when I joined uh, banking about 20 years ago in my first project in a very big universal bank, uh, a friend gave me this thick book 
uh, that was the logical model of banking, where you can open and see thousands of thousands of tables and entities and fields about how you run a bank, how you manage a bank, and what kind of data you need in order to be a bank. And for me, as a data geek, I was fascinated. I fell in love immediately. But seriously, uh, the reason banks need so much data is, as you said, to build this trust with customers. In order to keep your deposit safe, uh, we need to know you quite well. And even better, when we uh, uh, lend money to uh, borrowers, we need to make sure uh, some of those deposits that we use are very, very much um, uh, safe and well-funded. So that's create a lot of uh, data coming into the banks. And the idea is, again, to reduce the risk of how we manage this sensitive uh, business while we are aware of the complexity and the sensitivity it introduced by collecting so much data and, and capturing for quite a long time during your life as a customer. How can cloud-based technology connect these disparate systems? So banks were trying to build a very robust data management platform for more than 20 years now. Uh, one of the early versions of parallel compute, parallel processing of data was born in financial services. Uh, but again, the traditional enterprise technologies couldn't scale with the scale of data. And this is when open source and tech companies like Google, Yahoo, Facebook came with uh, the open source project around data and analytics, which introduced much more robust uh, way to manage and to analyze data. And But until the cloud was mature, banks were very struggling to build those clusters of big data on premise in a in a safe and robust way. When cloud uh, became much more mature, this open source technology is now available in a much more manageable way. It's a platform as a service in all cloud providers, in a very secure, the top engineers in the world behind AWS, behind Google, behind Microsoft, are building in a lot of resources, a very secure way to manage data in big scales, almost like Google doing for itself when crawling the whole internet and bringing the whole internet into their big data environment. How can cloud-based technologies actually connect the, these disparate systems together? So, you know, I think a lot of a lot of our banks have, you know, a cloud-first strategy, right? And we've, we've got to think about that in its totality. That doesn't mean that we're just going to throw everything out. Right. And Internet has a place of that. So does hosted cloud environments, which might be, you know, uh, industry orientated capabilities by a big provider. And also they're transforming their own data centers, right, to be more private cloud orientated and have the capabilities. I think when you look at that, you've now got data that's in a SaaS based service. And let's say that's a customer CRM, right, hosted there. You've now got on premise sort of reporting applications or business applications as well. And then you've got legacy. Um, what we, what we also have here is a multitude of different ways of how they're connecting. So let's say it's CRM and we're now talking about APIs, but actually in the middle of back end of it, we're still batch processed, right? So we're now picking up files and we're going to put it through a, a, a database and then into a mainframe, right? We've still got to speed up the whole supply chain of how data sort of moves through. There will always be, um, there will always be uh, data silos, right? Um, you know, and it's the very nature of how applications have been uh, evolved, grown, being procured because they're solving, you know, particular business problems. I think the bit is, is always being very cognizant is we've got the data. Actually, we more, should we also be focusing on the metadata as which describes where that data is and what it is about a, a particular individual or a product. And using that may be a better way of actually being able to search, connect and actually deliver those new experiences without actually moving the data where it needs to be. It's just referencing where that data should come from, which will allow some of those pools of data, A, not to grow more, but, you know, to actually use them in the right way versus actually I'm going to take all this data out of the cloud, put it on premise and then we'll use that. And he said, well, 
you've already, you've still got it in the cloud and now you've got it on premise which which one do you want to keep in sync you know it can having um lots of data all over the place obviously incurs a huge amount of cost management overheads and complexity and i think looking at it through things things like reference data and being able to connect to that data with ease is going to help reduce some of that complexity the benefit of cloud is that it allows you to uh quickly and easily um try, create new systems or expand existing systems without the need to invest in um, uh, hardware, essentially. So if, I, if I'm sitting there going, well, I've got this idea for a thing that might work, but I don't know whether it will work. You know, I, it's difficult to build a business case to say, can we buy a server for that, please? Because that's very expensive, that's a big investment. So you might not want to do that. But if you're on cloud, you can build it, pay for the time that you use, and then if it turns out to be a flop and doesn't really work, it's fine. All you've lost is the the you know the cost of uh, you know renting the, uh, the the computer processing power for you know however long you tried out your experiment for. Uh, similarly, if you're you know if you want to start something off at a small scale and then it rapidly becomes popular um, with on-premises hardware, it's difficult, right? You have to go out and buy another server, and you're not really sure how many to buy. Um, and you know that sort of thing. Um, whereas with uh, you know with cloud, you can just go in and go type number up. You know, increase number of instances I have, increase server size. You know, and it's fairly quick and easy and painless to do that. When it comes to some of these big transformations, the bottom line is always important. What are the benefits you have seen from transformation, though, in the in the short term? Because surely a big bank is focused on their quarter by quarter. Uh, um, results that they have to publish, right? That's an excellent question. Uh, in the short term is uh, get a control of what's going on. On your uh, system, on your process, get rid of complexity, get rid of unnecessary costs, and just put an order inside uh, your environment. This is a big win. You find an amazing ROI in a very, very short term. And this is an amazing foundation for you to continue with. The, um, the IT department yeah, still has a pretty critical role for, uh, for a bank. How can you harmonize your IT department with other subdivisions to ensure that everyone's vision of digital transformation and innovation are all on the same page? Sure. So, I'm not sure that many many people listening to this will like this answer, but the answer is put the IT department in charge. So um, the way that Starling Bank has uh, approached this is that we have put the engineering department, the engineering department, we don't call ourselves IT, we, you know, we're more software engineering. We've got much more control over what happens and how things happen. Uh, than uh, your traditional uh, bank or financial services IT department. So traditionally what would happen is um, a, a, another subdivision would come up with IT requirements, chuck them over to the IT department, the IT department codes it up, chucks it back you know, via some sort of QA, uh, UAT process. And then it goes, and then like three years down the line or what have you from the initial design, it goes into production. Um, the problem with that is that um, it requires a huge amount of work to get everyone on the same page, right? Because you only have one shot to make it correct. Because if you don't get it right, then it's going to be another three years before you get, you know, the second version in that corrects the, the changes, right? So it, it takes an awful lot of work to try and get harmony between these two different groups who are both incredibly busy with their day jobs as well and getting them in the same room to agree on a thing. Uh, I mean, the IT department, it's still a critical role for the bank and it, it is the heart in many ways. How can you harmonize your IT department with other subdivisions to ensure that everyone's singing off the same hint sheet, that everyone's vision of digital transformation and innovation are all on the same page? Yeah, it's a, it's it's one of those creative words. Everyone loves the word innovation, but you know, 
depending on where you are in in the organization it can mean many many different things i think uh traditionally it has been been seen as the cost center right we put money in and we we get we get some sort of functions out of it i think now as we as we look to work uh, look at uh modern day working and, and lean agile approaches of running programs and change right we're seeing that innovation because the business and IT is coming closer together. They're not two separate functions, right? And I think with chief digital officers, you know, CDOs now coming in from a data perspective, now you've got data-driven metrics, right? So the banks can really see what they're doing. We've got digital experience coming through. You've got IT looking at this phone. Well, how do we run this? How we can deliver this? And I think now they're leading the edge and said, listen, we've, we're tidying up our estate. We're reducing complexity to make it easier to bring new technology in. We're we're still we're still keeping the risk at bay, right? Which is fundamental to them in terms of operating the bank and also the the regulatory needs that they want to do. And I think now, in some cases, they're they're bringing new ideas to the table that allow them to be agile versus before. Okay, I like that initiative, and we'll, it will take us nine months to do that. Actually, let's spin up a, a pop up lab type of approach, and we'll work with you for for a month on on this initiative and see how we do now that from a technology might actually be spun up in the cloud right because they have access and they can do that versus or well you know we because of sensitivities we've got to run that in our own four walls we can't do that because of a b and c um i do see now the innovation starting to seep through quite quite aggressively as they start to you know modernize what they're doing themselves and i think also is their understanding around what the business is trying to achieve and and the building that common language and taxonomy around what the business is doing and how IT can actually play as part of that. Let's um let's now look at the long term. What are some of the benefits that we can see in the long run? No, oh, a long term benefit. I would say you know those banks who are you know transforming how they're doing things, right? Or looking at how they truly modernize. Now I'm working with um, a thought machine around how you are, you know, a core banking, cloud native banking platform and building an approach of how do we help customers move from monolithic onto, you know, these cloud natives. Those are the ones who are going to get the acceleration of speed. They're, they're going to get the benefit of modern day sort of architectural practices and principles as part of that. I think ultimately from a bank perspective, being able to switch on and change and bring new features to market in a very, very most, uh, efficient manner. I think the other one is because then they'll become more and more data driven, right? They'll get more data that they're already getting today, but they'll be able to link it up with ease and speed and actually start to be able to gain the insight of that data around you know, user activity, um, what's happening around their different product sets and how they're being consumed. What about things around fraud, right? You know, we've got a lot of those things already happening. Some of it's automated, some of it's semi-automated and some of it's still manual, right? In some cases. And I think that longer term investment of digital transformation will start to really aid the automation orchestration, the visibility of data with, with, with synonymous ease, right? And, and at least then the bank from a business perspective can start making more calculated risks with ease uh, and simplicity. Well, that's all we've got time for on today's episode of The Fintech Show. I'd like to thank Jason, Mike and Noam for their time and their insights. The role of a bank is changing and so too is the tech behind it it's becoming increasingly apparent that for a bank to survive the 2020s, it's got to be using the data that it owns in the most efficient way possible. Thanks for watching, and as usual, you can catch the rest of the episodes of The Fintech Show over at fintechf.com and on LinkedIn and YouTube. Bye for now.